Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so under normal circumstances, I would not upload two videos like this back to back, right? Because, you know, it's, it's something that I always try to kind of keep variety going and usually try to space it out over the course of a week or two. But I do want to cover this while it's still fresh in everyone's minds. So one of the big questions that came out of the, the last video that we did when it came to uh, Superman and, and the idea of Jonathan Kent growing older is what happened. And the interesting thing about this is that initially Bendis didn't really explain, right? Like all he really told us was that Jonathan was out in space and he was with his granddad and then he basically got sucked into like a vortex more or less like a big black hole and then ended up in a different dimension which presumably was earth 3 and all indications are that it is earth 3 and that in turn like he basically aged up and there wasn't a whole lot of explanation there the cool thing about this is that this story actually gives us that now the conflict between himself and earth 3 superwoman who is lois lane i mean she's an amazonian i guess so she's a combination of of wonder woman and and uh and lois in any event the the fight actually ends like really fast and there's really not a whole lot going there like not a whole lot doing but what he really seems to indicate here is that like jonathan kitt was here for a period of time and then he made his escape ran into superwoman along the way on earth 3 and now he's now basically he ends up back in his own dimension when he's rescued by his grandfather and he's essentially like whisked away superwoman's kind of defeated quick fast and in a hurry and then jonathan ends up back on the ship again and this is when the answers start to come in because when the questions asked what did you see like what's been happening jonathan kind of spills the beans a little bit but his grandfather's literally freaking out as if he hasn't seen jonathan for some time and that's when he basically tells him like i have haven't seen you in years it's been I've, I've been searching for you for years and years and years and so the implication here is that when Jonathan was sucked into you know basically yanked into this black hole and then ripped to another dimension that what essentially happened is he was thrown back in both time and space and so what it basically meant is that he's been just kind of free floating and it's, it's interesting when you when you think about this because for the most part aside from events like flashpoint and maybe a couple other moments here and there DC doesn't really invoke time travel in the same way that Marvel does right like Marvel invokes time travel all the time and Bendis loves to do that but with this with, with the idea of time travel it's almost impossible to find somebody right like the the equivalent of trying to find someone in space like when they're lost in space and time is it would be like me taking a rock and then just like throwing it randomly in an ocean so you know in, in like the pacific ocean somewhere and then saying now go find it like it'd be almost impossible for you to do that that's what it's like trying to track somebody down through time and space the fact that like Jor-El found Jonathan was chance it was it was it was pure chance like he was talking about having to like make all these bargains and make all these packs and we don't know explicitly what they are so we're kind of left to assume that maybe some of these bargains and packs he made led him to where Jonathan was but regardless of the situation assuming that like it was more of information brokering like he went that way as opposed to like travel to this place at these coordinates to this point in time and you will find Jonathan that it wasn't hitting it hitting it on the nose then the fact that Jor-El found him was was pure chance it was insurmountable odds that led to this but in in reality like from from the whole perspective as Jor-El puts it that that basically as far as the world's concerned Jonathan has been gone for like a little over three weeks weeks right like 22 days so like three weeks in one day he's basically been gone for that period of time but for for Jonathan it's been years and that's why he aged up is because basically he was just kind of yanked through a hole now in truth it doesn't really work that way black holes and, and physics don't really work that way but they are I mean it is comic book logic right so I mean one of the things I learned very early on when it comes to comic books is if what you're expecting is a real world physics application to comic books you're going to be disappointed um but again it's 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 intriguing you know it's, it's one of these interesting things because by and large like like the whole scenario here is that when it when it came to Jor-El, while he doesn't really seem to let it on or doesn't really say it outright, he's been struggling in a variety of ways. And really, one of the big ways it seems to be is like he's like, you know, he tells Jonathan, I could not go home without you. If Jor-El shows up back on Earth without Jonathan in tow, and the question's asked by like Superman and Lois Lane, where's our son? And he's like lost somewhere in the sands of time and space. Like, I wouldn't even be worried about Superman. I'd be worried about Lois. Like, she would lose her mind. Mama Bear would freak if she found out her son was like lost out there in space and time probably never to be seen or heard from again woe be tied Jor-El if he goes to earth and, and breaks that bit of news there but again it, it's these cool little things because one of the other half of you know, I guess really another part of this seems to be that like Jor-El loves Jonathan like he legitimately loves him as his grandson right and it kind of makes sense because when you look at the notion of like grandparents and grandchildren versus parents and children that in a lot of ways when grandparents look at their grandchildren it's kind of a way to at least spoil them or in some way while they're not directly raising 
raising their grandchildren, at least not under normal circumstances, to basically play a role that allows them to kind of correct some of the mistakes they made with their kids, right? Because every parent screws up. Every parent makes mistakes, or at least in their own mind, makes mistakes with their kids, even if they didn't necessarily screw up at all. But when it comes to Jonathan, when, I'm sorry, when it comes to Jorel, looking at Jonathan, in a lot of ways, this kind of seems to be like him acting out the role of a father that he always felt like he should have been, right? Like taking his son under his wing and training him and teaching him what he needs to know in order to understand the universe around him, right? This was not an option that Jor-El had with Superman. By the time Jor-El popped back up again, Superman was long since grown up. He would basically kind of established himself in the world of the DC superhero landscape. But for Jonathan, he's young, he's vibrant, he's fresh, he's brand new here. He's literally in, in a, well, at least aside from a couple smatterings of events here with the Teen Titans and some things with his, with his father, for the most part, he's a blank slate. And so being able to take him and throw him out into space and say, this is the universe, this is the world around you, this is how all this kind of stuff functions, this is how you reside in the place in it, this is the legacy your father made. A lot of this is Jor-El taking Jonathan under his wing and doing the things that he wished he'd had a chance to do with Kal-El, with his son, with, with Clark Kent. But again, those aren't really options that are there. But it, it's, it's intriguing because when he sits down and starts talking to him, Jonathan's response is like, I need to go home. Like, I need to leave. I need to get back. And... Jorel doesn't necessarily say no so much as you're not going to look the same. They'll recognize you, but like it'll be a bit of a shock to them. But it really kind of seems to be Jorel like preparing to take Jonathan back home, which again is kind of a cool thing. But the issue with all this is that as soon as that happens, they're suddenly met by the arrival of warships. Of course, you've got like General Zob, but they're led by Rogel Zar. And in turn, like Jonathan basically makes his escape or really kind of his suit ends up sending him back to Earth. But I want to talk about this for a second because again, this is the nature of Bendis writing. And that's why when it comes to Brian Michael Bendis, people only ever read him in one of two ways. Either they read him as like a, as like a whole omnibus run or they'll read it in and trade, uh, or at least I guess, I guess really the best way to read Bendis is to read it in trade or to read it as a whole run. Because when it goes, when you go issue by issue, sometimes it's kind of easy to get lost, right? Because where, where Jonathan Hickman's kind of a master at like setting seeds and different things like that, and then sort of building it all up, that in, in Bendis writing, it's very easy to get lost. You don't really have that problem with Hickman because it all sort of ties in, right? Like it's event one, then event two, then event three, then event four, and then you get all the way down to like event number 40, and then it all wraps back around to event one again, but it's a cohesive story that makes sense all all along the way. With Bendis, it's kind of event one, then event five, then three, then 28, and then 36, and then four, and it just kind of bounces all over the place, and it can become like really convoluted at times. It's not the worst thing. And again, the way that Bendis is writing Superman at the moment, I actually, I, I adore it. Like, I absolutely love it. It's interesting, it's fun, it's action-packed, but this is one of the reasons why Bendis writing is so intriguing, because it taps back into Rogel Zar. It says, hey, look, this guy who was cast into the Phantom Zone is back again. We don't know exactly how, and the assumption is that with this, this, because of the fact that Jonathan transfers back to Earth so fast that Rogozar made his escape. Now, my initial thought was, well, then Jonathan basically, like, he encountered Rogozar before Rogozar, like, fought Superman, right? Like, before the Unity Saga storyline. But, it, you know, that's doesn't really seem to be the case. Instead, what really seems to be going on is like Rogozar made his escape. And the reason why is because when Superboy is essentially jettisoned, you know, when, he, when he's teleported back to Earth, more or less, when he arrives back on Earth, uh, it's literally like, like he basically says like, I came to find you, you know, talking to talking to Superman and Lois, I came to find you as soon as I got back here, right? So like, we're kind of left to assume that no real time has passed. That from the time that Jonathan showed up here on Earth, that it might be minutes or maybe a day or so, but certainly probably not enough time for Superman to like race off into space, the whole saga with Rogozar to unfold, then that's it. You know, it's, there, there really isn't a whole lot of time there. So it's kind of a cool thing because the response to Superman is, well, then we have to deal with this. One, we have to go find my granddad, or I'm sorry, my father. And two, like we have to deal with Rogozar because he's not a villain you just leave out there, right? I mean, he's an extremist. He's a fanatic, destroying worlds, different things like that. The idea that it's, it suits a purpose and so on and so forth. This is, of course, Superman and Jonathan leading into that conflict. But once they arrive to the ship of where Jor-El is, as soon as they get there, all hell's broken loose. You literally have like all these forces of Rogozar facing off against all these Thanagarians, right? Like the race where Hawkman and Hawkwoman derive from. You've got all those, all these groups going to, you know, these two groups going to war with each other. And we have no idea what set all this off. <laughs> I mean, the Thanagarians are very much like a kind of a, a warrior race, right? And like they, they kind of police their own territory and so on and so forth. But again, like, like, things are popping off pretty bad. And I'm kind of curious to see what direction this goes because I can almost guarantee it's gonna, we're gonna see like a full invocation of the of the Green Lantern Corps being brought in. But still, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cool little thing. Uh, but I, I wanna go ahead and throw this out there again, relatively fast in comparison to the last video we did, just so that it's still fresh in everybody's mind and you guys get some much needed answers that I think a lot of you guys were looking for. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Later. Oh, you guys said peace. <laughs> I will catch you all later.
Peace.